following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So I wanted to talk a little bit about a basic need in life, which is to have something that we call health. And in any type of given system, there are laws, and there are energies. And in order to thrive in any given system, one needs to understand those laws and work with them, work in harmony with them. So if our interest is to develop spiritual life, to move beyond the mere physical level of existence and to experience something more profound, we need to understand how to live in harmony with the laws that manage those realms. So in this context, we understand that health has an implication and a meaning that's far beyond what we think of as health. There's much more to health than merely the physical. So in today's discussion, I want to bring up some basic concepts and invite you to analyze your approach to health, your understanding of health, and your moment-to-moment -moment experience of health so that you can increase it, improve it, and have greater health. This first image that we see in our, in our PDF represents a divine state, a state of being. In this image, we see two symbols, archetypes, in an embrace. These archetypes come from the Greek tradition. And they represent very elevated aspects of ourselves. I know that we generally approach mythology thinking that the gods and heroes of mythology represent something in the ancient past, or they represent literal gods that dwelled in the clouds. But this is not the true meaning. These archetypes or symbols represent states of being that we ourselves can reach and access and experience. So to discuss health, we need to really understand, firstly, what that means and how the, our understanding of health is different from what we find in the world today. The topics and the subjects and the meanings that we discuss in these lectures are not the opinions of the instructors. So what I say today will not be merely my opinion. My goal, like every instructor, is to open the door to an ancient knowledge that has nothing to do with the personality or the ego or the physical presence of an instructor, but instead gives you access to a stream of knowledge, a continuity of knowledge that is eternal and that has always existed and that has never changed. And this is the key thing. The concept of health and healing and awakening that we will discuss in this lecture 
is not a changeable concept. It has never changed. This is very different from modern society's concept of health, which changes, it seems, every other day. All of the so-called wise scientists and doctors of this era will state emphatically that we must follow a certain behavior and they will fight tooth and nail to make laws to force us to follow that behavior. And then a few months later, they will say, oh, no, no, we were wrong. It's actually this other way. And you must do this and this and this. And this vacillation back and forth has been going on for centuries. But the state of the eternal knowledge has never changed. It has always said the same things. It has always taught the same things. But it is taught according to the mentality, to the psyche, and to the level of the humanity that receives it. So gnosis, the knowledge that we study, is an eternal knowledge. And it has come down to us through many instructors, through many teachings, many lineages, many traditions all over the world and beyond this world. And this second image represents some of the teachers that have provided this knowledge to us. And there are many others. These are just a few examples from different traditions around the world. As such, we can have confidence in the tradition that they have provided. These instructors, such as the angel Raphael, are great masters of medicine, awakened beings who have a type of insight and wisdom and knowledge that is completely so far beyond the medical knowledge of so-called modern science that there's really no comparison. And today we're going to touch on some of the conceptual ways of seeing that so that we can begin to then experience that difference. So firstly, we have to discuss what is health? What does that mean? What do we really understand by health? Obviously, in modern times, our definition of health primarily relates to the physical body. And this has been this way for quite some time, centuries, that people have only thought of health in terms of physicality, in terms of how we feel, whether we're sick or not. In terms of the public understanding of health. Now, those who study health, such as doctors and other practitioners of different healing traditions, have understood health to be a little more sophisticated than just the physical body. And they've included in that, that health also means the state of our mind, the state of our emotional well-being. But see, this understanding of health has one key difference from the point of view of health and the practice of being healthy in the Gnostic tradition. And that is the terrestrial traditions, the scientific traditions, the exoteric or public traditions, such as medical science in the West, even many traditions in the East, only relate health with the relative state of our physicality, meaning that our state of health is in direct proportion to how close we are to death physically. And this is how most people think of health. If you're not dying, you're healthy. This is how we think. And so most people now think, well, if I'm not dying, I don't need to go to the doctor. I don't need medicine. I must be fine. And we don't really analyze the true nature of our health and understand that that is not what health means. Health is much more than just how quickly we are approaching death. It is much more than that. This image is a rather romantic painting depicting what in many traditions is called Arcadia. 
It's also called in the Bible, Eden. And these terms refer to, on one level, ancient times. Times that modern history has no knowledge of. These are ancient times that are far past any of our written records. And in those ancient, ancient times, the humanity that existed at that time, and there was a humanity at that time, but it was not in the physical world. It was a humanity that had bodies, but they were not in three-dimensional matter. They were in more subtle levels. That humanity had perfect health. And that's what this image represents. This, what we call now an idyllic civilization or an idealized past. And most people nowadays think this is just a fantasy. But if you really look into the histories and the mythologies and the traditions around the world, most of them preserve memories of a time in which humanity was perfectly healthy. And that perfect state of health was a state of joy. Not just physical health, spiritual health. In which humanity had no suffering, no conflict, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, physically. And was in a state of peace. No conflict in any of the kingdoms. And to us, this sounds like a fantasy because it's so far from what we experience now. But the fact is, even though modern traditions have forgotten, that, that is what we've come from. That is the natural state of a human being. Perfect health. Equanimity, joy, peace. Cognizant love, happiness for others. Chastity. No war, no hate, no violence. No doubt, no despair, no depression, no anger. We once had that. But as you know from studying religion, we lost that. The point is, this state of being is recoverable. That's why we have a spiritual path. We have been given teachings by the great masters, by those who have fulfilled those teachings and reached that perfect state of health because they have compassion for us and because they know that they have achieved it. Thus, it is equally possible for us to achieve it. And so they provide that to us out of love. Our problem is we don't believe it. We've become so habituated to our suffering, we don't believe that health, true health, is possible. Instead, we seek diversion from our pain in materialism, in sensations, in all of our futile pursuits. Nevertheless, let's make it clear that perfect state of health, that primordial level of being is impossible to reach with the bodies that we have now. Now this sounds very dramatic, but it is a fact. And I state it explicitly like that to make it clear so that we don't have any illusion so that we know clearly what it is that must be done to reach that perfect state of health. The scriptures are full of instructions about this. The bodies that we have, not just the physical body, but our psychological body, is overrun with illness. Not just physical illnesses, psychological illnesses. Of such profound depth they cannot be healed. Now this sounds a little dramatic and some might say negative, but it isn't. 
This is how you find a cure. You first have to analyze objectively the illness and identify it and recognize it. And then you can move past it. What I'm actually telling you is quite hopeful if you can understand it properly. But to understand it properly, you have to understand that true health is not limited to the physical body. The physical body we have is born in sin, is decrepit, is decaying. It is not capable of that perfect state of health. It is flawed. It is imperfect. It is made out of impure substance. It is not capable of transmitting and sustaining the energy of a perfectly healthy being. That's why all the traditions emphasize that we need to die. That death is not just physical, psychological. It's the death of everything that we are that is impure, so that the purity that we still have can be born anew. And the Bible talks about this as being born again. Unfortunately, the modern Christians think that they don't have to die to be born. When the truth is, Jesus himself died in order to be reborn, to resurrect. And this is precisely what is necessary for us to reach perfect health, truly perfect health. Now, until we reach that stage of development, we need health. We don't need to die yet. We need to take advantage of what we have, cure what we can cure, and work towards that goal. This is a long process. Just dying today doesn't solve the problem. If we were to die physically, the problems remain the same because the problems are rooted deeper in us than the physical body. Our problems are multidimensional. So this next image shows us the tree of life, which is mentioned in the Bible. That tree is not a literal tree. It is an uh, approach to how nature functions. This symbol has many levels of meaning. But from the context of our own personal development, we need to understand it psychologically. This is the most important way for us to understand this image, is to understand it psychologically. Later, as we develop ourselves, we get more and more meanings and more and more depth out of this symbol. But the very beginning of this work begins with understanding it in context of ourselves. This represents us. So we see dimensions, worlds, levels of nature. We all know that we have physical bodies. And we all know that our physical bodies have vitality in them, energy. So that physicality is represented here on the tree of life with this bottommost white sphere, which in Hebrew is called Malkut, which means the kingdom. And our body, physically speaking, is a kingdom. It is our own kingdom. We don't rule it. Really, the body controls us most of the time. Because when it's hungry, when it wants to sleep, when it wants to go somewhere, when it wants sensations of different kinds, we just give it. We don't really run the body. We don't really have control over our own physical body, much less anything else. We let the body run us. That's why it's so hard for us to stay in shape or to eat the right things or to do the right things because we are under a hypnotic state. And the sensations that the body feels are a big part of that hypnotic state. So what animates that body is its vital energy, which is represented in the next sphere up, which is called yasod. That means the foundation. And really, that foundation is the foundation of all living things. Life itself. That vitality, that sphere on the tree of life, represents the energies that animate us physically. And that, of course, is constantly changing. 
the amount of energy that we have fluctuates continually, especially if we have a lot of bad habits. That energy goes up and down and up and down. And then we need to take in substances to try to supplement that energy, such as caffeine, vitamins, drugs, different medicines, whatever it is that we rely on to keep us going. When we were babies, we didn't need those things. As adults, we get worse and worse because we abuse that energy more and more. We also find in ourselves that we have the energies and the experiences of emotion, thought, will. Those are also represented here in the next three. Emotion, thought, and will. But these parts of ourselves we're less clear about. Some people can't tell the difference between emotion and thought. And very few can identify in themselves will. Mostly what we experience are the sensations of the body, its rising and falling energies, and this chaotic, continually surging stream of very confusing emotions and thoughts that constantly contradict each other. And this is our state of life. From moment to moment, from day to day, from week to week, a sea of sensations in the body, of fluctuating energies, of confusing emotions and thoughts. None of which we have any control over. We like to think we do, but we really don't. And the proof is in the experience of it. If you really think you have control over these four aspects of yourselves, Make your body physically perfectly still. Just do it for a half hour. No movement at all. Perfectly still. You'll probably find you can't if you've never meditated because your vital energy wants to move. You twitch. You itch. You get pains, you wanna get up, you wanna run around, you wanna leave, you wanna stand, you, wanna, you don't want to sit still. Much worse, you can't stop your emotions, you can't stop your thoughts. So this is why most people, when they try to learn to meditate, can't, because we have no control. We have no real dominion. And what is that? That is will. We don't really have the willpower to make these lower aspects, the four below will, still, quiet, at rest, at peace. It's rare for us to feel genuine peace on any of these levels. And it seems that from year to year, it's getting harder because it's harder and harder to survive. It's harder and harder to compete it's harder and harder to see anything clearly. Because life is getting more and more complicated. So these upper two, spirit and intuition, people have a lot of theories about these, but very few have ever experienced them, even though they are a part of us. Now these seven aspects of ourselves constitute these seven lower sephiroth or spheres on the tree. And above that are more subtle levels that make up who we are. We have no idea about those things. We have names for them. We call them God, Allah, Buddha, the self, many names. But very few have ever experienced that and can know definitively that what they experienced was that we are, bar we are barely able to identify our experiences of the very lower levels of this tree. So to understand health, we really need to understand this. Because all of these relate to each other. They all interpenetrate each other. They are all part of one being, which is ourselves. And our health is relative to this. You see, these seven levels 
If you really think about it and you look at it and you study it in yourself, you see that these become more subtle. Physicality is quite dense. And all of us can experience that easily because we're in our physical bodies. Vitality is a little more subtle. We can recognize it because we feel energy. Sometimes we have a lot of energy. Sometimes we have none. But we can recognize that experience. Emotion, more subtle. Thought, about the same, maybe a little more subtle. Depends on the person. More or less the same. Will, even more subtle. Intuition and spirit beyond our scope of perception for most people. Now what's interesting about this and important is that the flow of energy in nature flows from the top down. All things that happen flow from the top down. When the universe was originally beginning, when this planet was created, when our physical body was created, all things that manifest, there is a light, a force, an energy that moves down this structure in order to give manifestation to that. Let's talk about a simple example. You, walking down the street, suddenly get a brilliant idea of something that you've needed, something that you've wanted, and it just came out of nowhere. And suddenly you realize, with all of yourself, that this is what you needed. I need to create this project. I need to do this thing. We can say that that is intuition. And then immediately you feel that inspiration to do it, the will to do it, that's here. Then comes the idea, the thought, the way to actually accomplish it. And accompanying that is the excitement, the conviction, the emotion. And then, of course, is that surge of energy to do it. But then you have to actually do it physically. You see, all that experience of having the inspiration happens psychologically in yourself. That's up here in all this subtle area. But to actually do it physically, a lot of people get a lot of ideas. Everybody gets ideas. How many carry them out? It's true, right? All of us get ideas for the great novel, the great painting, the great symphony, the great invention. But how many do it? How many carry it out? All of us have the idea, the inspiration, to succeed spiritually, to create the soul, to become a realized being, an angel, a master, a Buddha. But how many actually fulfill it? It's very rare. So the important thing here to recognize is how that moves through us. And this corresponds directly to our health. Directly. Let's look at a simple example. Some person is diagnosed with cancer. That cancer, of course, is visible in the physical body. It has an illness. It's sick. There are symptoms. There are problems. The doctors are trying to treat it, but their power is very limited. And that's because cancer doesn't originate in the physical body. It originates in the internal bodies. The doctors don't know about these things. They can't treat them. They think it's rubbish. Theories. Now, the person who got that cancer... is experiencing that in all of these levels. When they get the news, of course, they may physically become, their posture will change, they may become tense, they may cry, they may become angry. They'll experience differences in their energy flow, they will experience a lot of emotions, they will have thoughts that occur. But what is the most significant thing that differentiates the different patients who are prescribed with a serious illness? We can find a group of patients that all have cancer, maybe all at the same sort of level, same degree of cancer. Some die very fast. Some hold on. And some, somehow, are cured. 
Now, to us, this is all mysterious and vague, and it doesn't make a lot of sense. But if you really look at real-life experiences, you'll discover that those people who had the will to conquer it, the will to live, the courage to do whatever they could to fight, they generally succeed. Not always. But there are many cases, many cases, even in the cases of life-threatening, deadly illnesses, that people overcome all the odds because they're able to harness levels of power that are far beyond the physical. You see what I'm pointing at? Health flows from the top down. True health. It doesn't flow from the bottom up. There are many people in the world who, physically speaking, only eat organic. They don't eat any meat. They buy all of the best foods that they can get. They only wear organic cotton clothes. And they really physically are doing everything that you could possibly imagine to take care of themselves. But they are insanely sick. Not just physically, but emotionally, mentally. And why is that? Because health does not flow from the bottom up. It is not determined by our physical state. Our health is determined by our internal state. This is the exact opposite of what modern science is saying. The modern science says, take this pill and you will be healthy. Take these vitamins and you will be healthy. Buy these products and you will be healthy. It's all wrong. We agree we need to eat properly. We need to drink properly. We need to breathe properly. We have to take care of the physical body. We need it. We can't abuse of it. But that isn't the origin of health. Health comes from internally. It comes from superior levels, far beyond this physical body. So in order for us to apply that, we need to go deeper. We need to understand that these levels that we have in ourselves are actually levels of matter, energy, and consciousness. When we talk about our physicality and our vitality, these are different dimensions in us. Our physical body is in the third dimension, but the vitality we have is fourth dimensional. It's not entirely physical. It's more subtle. And the way that that energy moves between the two is very specific. Likewise, between emotion and physicality. For us to feel emotions here physically, that energy comes from somewhere else. It doesn't, it's not created in the body. Thought is not created in the body. It comes from elsewhere. It comes from a more subtle level. The physical body is the outer layer. It's the most dense layer. But really, it's multidimensional. And what allows the energy to move between these levels of ourselves are what are called chakras. Chakras are simply transformers of energy. They simply move energy from one dimension to another. That's all. Everybody nowadays thinks the chakras are a big deal. And everybody wants to awaken their chakras. But they have been very poorly taught about the chakras. Unfortunately. You see, in all of us, the energy is moving between these dimensions in us. The problem is it's moving badly. The problem is that these chakras only move the energy that they're given. And the energy we move through ourselves psychologically and physically is generally poorly transformed because it's charged with anger and pride and lust and fear, envy and jealousy, all of which are negative and all of which create illness. So when we move clean energy through these chakras, healthy energy, light, they also become more effective 
And as they become more effective, they will awaken. And they have extra abilities that they provide to us in that case. But that's a process. To reach that process, we have to first work here and now, studying ourselves, understanding how we move energy. So in this tradition, we study what we call three brains. Here in our physical bodies, we can sense and experience thought. All of us can, easily. This is nothing unusual. And we relate thought with what we call intellect or the intellectual brain. And that's centered, of course, in the physical brain. But thought is not the brain. Thought is the energy that moves through the brain. The brain is simply a transmitter. The brain is simply a machine that processes energy. It doesn't create the energy. It does not originate the energy. It simply processes it. So our experience of that relates to our health. This is what we all call mental health. And in the recent couple of centuries, there's been a lot more interest in mental health as an actual subject. But unfortunately, that approach, the common public approach, has limited itself and has not grasped the full picture of what the mind is, of what the intellect is, and how the energy moves in us in the form of thought. The thing is that this brain, centered in our head, as a transformer of energy, simply receives the energy it's given and processes that energy. And we experience it as thinking. Just like the chakras, all it can do is transform the energy it's given. If it's being given continually poor energy, poor quality energy, all it can give is poor results, like any machine. If you take your car and you put the cheapest fuel in it, you will get the worst results. That car won't be fit for racing or for more extreme needs because the fuel that it has is not capable. And the same is true of our intellect. If what we put in that intellect is of poor quality, the result will be poor. And the same applies to the second aspect of our psyche that we study called the emotional brain. If what we take into ourselves emotionally is of poor quality, the result will be poor. It's very obvious, isn't it? But how many of us have ever thought about that? And if you study our society, you will see immediately, this is a huge cause of many of our problems. Humanity now is addicted to ridiculous intellectual pursuits. Truly, absolutely absurd intellectual pursuits, theories and concepts and beliefs and ideas that have no bearing at all on anything of value. And yet people dedicate their lives to pursuing stupid, stupid things. In complete willful ignorance of the actual state of the world. Let's give some simple examples. There are people who with their intellects, their minds, are seeking to craft the most cunning, devious ways to get your money to get your vote, to get your signature, by any means necessary, by tricking, by lying, by fooling, by making you think you're getting something for nothing. The world is filled with that mentality. People selling products, creating concepts and ideas and theories that they want you to accept. Meanwhile, all around them, the world is falling apart. People dying. People suffering. Isn't it astonishing to anyone that so many people are pursuing, let's say another example, foolish emotional energies, fuel, things that they pursue emotionally, like for example, studying the details of the lives of celebrities, 
knowing everything that's going on with the celebrities and feeling this emotional connection with people they don't even know and will never know, reading all the magazines and watching all the shows, for what? They're getting an emotional sensation from that and willfully ignoring the suffering in their own families, the suffering of their colleagues and communities, willfully ignoring it. Why? How can that be? That is not a state of health. That is an emotional illness. So you see here, when we talk about health, it's not just physical. And it isn't in terms of emotional health and mental health, it isn't just, we're not talking about schizophrenia and delirium. These are strong illnesses in the psyche. But all of this humanity is sick. Look at the world we have made. That is the evidence. We have made it. We all like to say those other people did it. But every single one of us is contributing to the state of this planet. Every one of us, without any exception. We buy the products. We sustain the systems. We vote, we put in our energies, and we get out of it what we want. Thus, we are the ones making it happen. And all because we are sick, intellectually, emotionally, and physically. So our illnesses truly are profound. The third brain, the motor instinctual sexual brain, it relates obviously to the body. But not just physical illness, not just having the flu or the cold or something like that. Many of us have illness in our motor center. We have habitual tendencies, habits that are fundamentally flawed. Things that we just do and do and do every day or every week out of habit that are causing harm for ourselves and others. Many of us have instinctual illnesses, behaviors on an instinctive level that hurt others and hurt ourselves. And naturally, this whole planet is sexually very sick. This is actually the cause of what's wrong with this planet, is the sexual illness. And it is the cause of why things have gotten so bad here and now. You see, in all of these levels of ourselves, in all of these three brains, in all of the different aspects of our multidimensional health, the most powerful force that we ourselves here and now have access to is our sexual energy. It's far more powerful than the intellect. It's far more powerful than emotion. It's far more powerful than any motor habit or instinctive habit. It's that sexual power. It is actually also the key to the most powerful medicine that we can ever find. And we're going to talk about that. So to understand all of this that I've explained, we're going to study a little passage from a very important scripture from Buddhism. It is perhaps worldwide the most common, most important scripture that Buddhists study. And in the Pali language, it's called Dhammapada. And this scripture has been widely translated. It's widely available. It is very beautiful. But like all scriptures, people study it literally. They don't study esoterically. They don't really look at the deeper meaning because they're not trained to do so. So today I want to give you a few indicators so that you can start to look at this scripture and others like it in a deeper way. This image, of course, represents the Buddha Shakyamuni who is credited with bringing Buddhism to the world. But it should be noted, firstly, he did not come in order to establish a religion. It was not his intention. His intention, as he stated very clearly, was to uncover the causes of suffering and to give people a way to change it. Simply that. That was his sole intention. To point out the causes of suffering and to change it. And secondly about him, he stated clearly that he did not invent anything. 
he stated that what he taught was the ancient path that was walked by other masters before him. And it's the same thing that we say. We're not inventing anything. None of this is my opinion or the opinion of any instructor here. We're teaching what was always taught and what will be taught. But this image, even though we say it represents that man from, from many thousands of years ago, really, it represents part of ourselves. That word Buddha means awakened. And that's our goal in spirituality, is to become awakened, to become like the Buddha Shakyamuni. To follow his footsteps, to identify the causes of suffering, and to change that to not suffer anymore. And what does that mean? It means to achieve that state of perfect health. So this passage is the first sentence in his most famous teaching, the Dhammapada. And in Pali language, I know on, in English this is quite long, but in Pali language it's only, what, maybe 20 words. It's quite short. But those words don't exist in English. So to really explain the meaning of it, it's quite long in English. So I didn't put the Pali version because it would take longer to explain. I just put it in English so we can talk about it because we have a lot to cover. So the first sentence says, Phenomena are preceded by the mind-heart, ruled by the mind-heart, made of the mind-heart. In Pali, that word mind-heart in English, the word Pali is mano. And it relates to Sanskrit, the, relate, the word man or manas. Now, in most cases, if you investigate this type of scripture, you'll find that this word mano being interpreted by Westerners, whether they realize it or not, they impose upon it their Western sensibility. So they tend to translate that word mano as intellect. And that's wrong. That isn't the meaning. Or they'll say mind. But see, all of us in the West with our strong intellect, think mind is intellect, and it is not. Mind is manas. Man. It's the root of the word man. But that word doesn't mean masculine. It means a being, a person, a human. And that word also has that syllable, man, in it, which relates to our psyche. And this is a more accurate way to look at it. Mano really relates more to psyche. And that's why in this presentation of the scripture, I put mind-heart. Because in Asian psychology, philosophy, the words mind, intellect, consciousness, which have many different uh, translations in Sanskrit or Pali or the other languages you look at, they don't relate to what we think of as mind, which is simply the intellect. They really relate to psyche, which is mind-heart. It's much more comprehensive. That's why when you study Buddhism and Hinduism, they don't differentiate between intellect and emotion. You don't find passages where they specify that emotion and intellect are different. They don't. It's not there. They consider them to be at the same level. And if you look at the tree of life, they are. When you examine the tree of life, you see right here. Mind, heart. Heart. Fifth dimension, same level, but more specifically in us, because we haven't created the soul yet, because we haven't elaborated that level of being, those bodies, we have really just mind heart, lunar, an undeveloped mind, the raw material to create a real mind. So this term mono has, is very significant in that way. Specifically because it says phenomena are preceded by the mind-heart. Now, if you really meditate on that phrase and really contemplate that phrase, it will turn you upside down. It really will. Because it's the opposite of the way we think things are. We think, wrongly, that everything is there, everything outside of us is existing, and then we see it. This is saying the opposite. This is saying first we're there and then everything else. 
Phenomena are preceded by the mind-heart, which means that the mind-heart is there before the phenomena is there. That means you are there before anything else is there. This is a profound implication. And it goes further to explain, if you speak or act with a corrupted mind-heart, then suffering follows you as the wheel of the cart, the track of the ox that pulls it. This is simple cause and effect. And it's an it's extrapolation of that first sentence. It's stating simply, what you experience is the result of how you perceive. How you behave. How you act. And further it says, phenomena are preceded by the mind-heart, ruled by the mind-heart, made of the mind-heart. If you speak or act with a calm, bright mind-heart, then happiness follows you like a shadow that never leaves. So let's put this very profound statement about which we could give courses and courses of teaching because it's so deep. Let's put it in context of our physical experience now. Who among us is being pursued by suffering continually? That it, no matter what we do, we are continually having problems. Is there anyone here like that? That just continuing to have problems, no matter what we do. We find spiritual teachings and we think, now I'm on my way and everything's going to be better, but things just seem to get worse. And now I've got this great job or I've graduated from school and now things are going to be better. Or now I've got a spouse, I'm married now and things are going to be better. Anybody find that they just keep getting more intense, that the suffering is still there? It's true for everyone, isn't it? There's two things to point out here. Firstly, who is it that thinks that we're going to get to some place where there is no suffering? Who is it in us that thinks that way? And if you really reflect on that, you realize that you've always thought that way and it's never happened, but you continue to think that way. Right? Oh, now I've found these lectures or these classes. Now everything's going to get better. No, <laughs> it doesn't happen. Or do you move to a new city or you make new friends or whatever the status of your physical circumstances? The suffering continues to follow you. Why? It's right here. If you speak or act with a corrupted mind heart, then suffering follows you. Now this word suffering is really significant too. In Pali, it's dukkha. And that suffering is not simply physical illness. It is any imbalance in our health as a being. From top to bottom. We have a lot of that. We have physical suffering, of course. Especially as we get older. Especially if we get sick. And both of these are inevitable for everyone. All of us are going to get older. And all of us are going to get sick. But the more profound suffering, as grave as physical suffering can be, the more profound is in the mind-heart. Remember, those levels of experience and dimensionality. The higher you go, the more powerful it is. Physical suffering can be intense, but emotional suffering can be a lot worse. Maybe you haven't experienced that. But it's true. Physical suffering has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It always ends. It may last some specified period of time. It may be intense, but it always ends even if it just ends with your physical death. But emotional suffering does not die. When the physical body dies, the emotional suffering does not die. When the physical body dies, the mental suffering does not die. They're not physical. They are more profound. They are more lasting. They are more afflictive. And thus, they're more important. Those are the types of suffering we really need to address. Those are the types of suffering produced in this way, with our will. You see, if you speak or act with a corrupted mind heart, why do you do it? Because you want to. Because you will it. When you're angry, that anger controls your willpower. 
Isn't it true? When you become really angry with somebody, you want them to suffer. And so what you say and what you do is an expression of that anger, the will of that anger. So your willpower is trapped in that anger. And the result of that is suffering for the other person and for yourself. Anger can never create peace. Neither can lust or pride or envy or jealousy. They can only create suffering. They are afflictions. They are illnesses. They are diseases, psychologically speaking. So if you speak or act with a corrupted mind heart, a mind heart filled with pride or anger or envy or lust or greed or gluttony or laziness, any of these discursive, afflictive qualities, suffering follows you. This is the first and most basic statement of Buddhism. But who gets it? Who understands it? Who lives it? Who among us that love Buddhism or study Buddhism live that in our experience from moment to moment? We don't because the diseases we have, the afflictions we have are too strong. But the antidote, the medicine is said here. If you speak or act with a calm, bright mind, heart, then happiness follows you. That happiness is not simply a big smile, money in the bank, whatever it is that we say will make us happy, the new car or whatever. That happiness is a type of contentment that is the natural state of the consciousness itself. It is that image of Arcadia. It is to taste that, a primordial, untouched, unblemished, perfect joy, which is really our natural state and can be accessed by anyone. And so here this, the antidote is quite simple. Speak or act with a calm, bright mind, heart. Calm, bright. Bright is the key word. A beautiful word. So let's see what that means. Firstly, how do we use our mind, heart? How do we experience being, existing, living through perception? We know we are here now. We know we are alive. We know there is existence because we perceive it. No one can deny that. And our experience is the interaction between the internal and external. That's true also, right? So what causes that? What creates that? What allows that is perception. It is the way the energy moves from inside to outside, from the soul to the world and the world to the soul, from outside manifested phenomena to the internal. It's the senses that provide that. Now, physically, we all have learned as children about the five senses. And we know those are taste and touch and smell and hearing and sight, etc. And we don't think about that anymore. We just, oh yeah, there's five senses, okay. But in reality, we need to learn a little bit more than that because that's not the full picture. In Buddhism specifically, it's explained that we have six senses. And most people think, oh, the sixth sense. I want that. That must be some spiritual power. It's not what we're talking about. We will eventually. The sixth sense in Buddhism is the way we perceive in our heads they call it mind. And we always think it's intellect. It is not. It is not intellect. It is imagination. It is what we experience in thought and feeling. What we experience inside is another form of perception. The proof is very easy to see. All of us right now can experience those five senses externally, and we can recognize them very easily. But you can also recognize the internal perception do you have a thought? Are you thinking? That is an internal perception with, related with imagination, that a power of perception inside. And if I suggest to you that you imagine a big, beautiful cake, you can easily imagine that cake. That is that sixth level of perception, the sixth aspect, which is related with the psyche, with the mind-heart. Now, how does that happen? 
because energy is moving from outside to inside and inside to outside. It's constant fluctuation of energy that's moving in us. And the bulk of it is happening through our head, which is why we use this image. And, then, and on this image, we see the Hebrew letter resh, which is related with our head. And we gave lectures about that. You can study those. But if you look at and, and really feel and become aware of yourself here and now, you'll realize that your center of perception is really up here. That when we feel ourselves and become aware of ourselves, it's really all rooted here in the brain. And this is why we all think that ourselves are stuffed here in the brain. This is wrong, of course, because we aren't centered in the brain. It's just our perception is rooted in the nervous systems. And so we have that impression that we are the brain. But we aren't. This is all related with how energy moves through us. And the way we perceive, the way we see inside and outside, is like how we see anything. We see with energy that's moving. So those of you who are in front of me as I talk can see me. And that means that you're receiving a vibration of energy through your eyes. And those who can hear me are hearing the sound of my voice through a vibration that moves into the ears. This is very obvious, very simple, but none of us really are cognizant of that. Now that vibration is simply a modification of energies that are in nature, in manifestation already. And there are a lot of deep studies of how those energies are transformed and moved. What we need to study is how we ourselves are transforming that energy from moment to moment. The first step of that is to observe it, to become aware of it. We call it self-observation. But once you become aware of it, you then need the ability to transform it consciously. This is a very difficult art to perfect, but it is the art of awakening. It is to know how to receive impressions and transform them so that you're not consuming garbage, but instead taking the wisdom, the knowledge, the insight out of every perception. Many people mistakenly think that the only way they can acquire knowledge or gnosis, this type of spiritual teaching, is to go off to India or Mexico or, or the Nordic lands or some other place in order to get that knowledge. But the fact is, the truth is, that gnosis is in each moment if you're simply willing and able to acquire it. Every perception you have contains knowledge if you can access it, if you can transform it and get it. So the one who's really transforming impressions is never bored, is never seeking some distraction to entertain them intellectually or emotionally or physically because in every perception, they are acquiring knowledge of how things function, of their own being in relation with nature. So this image here represents for us how we are transforming energy from moment to moment. And what is energy? Spiritually speaking, we always use one word for energy, light. Not physical light. The light that radiates from the absolute. That light which is in every atom. That light which gives rise to everything that exists. And Jesus gave a very beautiful teaching about that light. He said, the candle of Soma is perception. Therefore, when the thine perception is of good nature, thy whole Soma is photenas, full of light. But when thine perception is of a bad nature, thy Soma is also full of darkness. Now, He's saying exactly what the Buddha Shakyamuni said. When we understand that light is that energy of the absolute that's flowing through nature, and that light is what provides health, it is that highest energy on the tree of life that's flowing down to give rise to all things, thus it is the source of pure, pure and perfect health. That is the light that fills all things. That is the light that created Arcadia and that perfect state. 
That light is flowing in to us in all things, in all moments, into our nervous systems. And we are transforming that light according to our current condition. And that transformation is resulting in our current experience. If our experience is suffering, it is because we are transforming the light in the wrong way. That's what he's saying. This Greek word soma means body. Don't read that literally. Like it's kindergarten. This is a teaching from Jesus, Yeshua, a great master. And what he's teaching here is extremely profound, not simple. So don't think you can read this in the same way you read a magazine. You cannot. This meaning is extremely deep. That word soma applies to the many levels of our being. Soma means body, but it has many levels of use. All of us in our current state have soma, but it's animal. We aren't really human beings. We're living in a very animalistic level. So our soma is animalistic. But if we develop and raise our level of being, we create new bodies, new levels of soma, until we create what are called celestial or heavenly bodies. This is what Paul talks about. And he explains that there are many levels of these types of bodies. The bodies of an angel are also called soma, but they're nothing like ours because they're clean. They're not filled with impurities like ours are, physical bodies and internal bodies. So what Jesus is stating here when thine perception is of a good nature, thy whole soma is also full of light. Now, when we compare this to that teaching of the Buddha, we see that really they're saying the same thing. That our perception and our transformation through our mind heart is what's creating our experience. So let's look at this in Jesus' context. If we look inside of our soma, that soma is the physical body, the vital body, the emotional body, the mental body, the causal body. When we really look into ourselves, what do we see? So if we all close our eyes and really try to look into ourselves, what do we see? Darkness. When you close your eyes to look inside, can you see light? Can you see as well or better than you see with your physical eyes? Because you can. It is possible. That is what is called clairvoyance. That is what people call the sixth sense. It is to be able to see with the powers provided by the chakras. This is why I pointed them out. Those chakras are the points of connection between the different parts of soma. When they are active, even in a negative way active, they provide vision internally. You see, that type of vision internally, clairvoyance, can be positive or negative. A sorcerer, a witch, can see internally. That person can close the physical eyes and see clairvoyantly. It, just the same as seeing physically, but with the physical eyes closed. That's called clairvoyance. That is that type of perception. It can be negative or positive. The prophets also see that way. That type of vision, when it's properly developed, is more clear, more real than what you see with your physical eyes. There's more light. And again, it's because when we remember those dimensions, the higher you go, the more powerful. The more light there is. So if we look inside of our body, our soma, which again is the physical, the emotional, the mental and we feel and sense and see darkness? The answer is here. It's because our perception is of a bad nature. There is no one to blame in the world except ourselves. Jesus is stating it with perfect clarity. We cannot blame the government or the church or the mayor or the president or the military or the corporations or our parents, or our spouse, or anyone. Our experience, our perception, is our own. Self-generated. 
So our health is also self-generated. So if we want to transform our overall health, let us transform our perception and learn to see. So he continues to explain this. He says, Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth enlighten thee. Very beautiful teaching. So take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee. This word light in Greek is false. We've given some lectures about that word already. Very profound word. The light that is in us is the light that gives us the ability to be alive. And all of us have that. It is the very energy of living, of being alive. But that light is modified according to our state of being. According to how we transform impressions. The state of our psyche. And the state of our psyche, those superior levels, determines the state of our physicality. This is why, like I explained, someone can eat all the best food and drink the best water and, and breathe in the best air, but be very sick. And that's precisely because they're not dealing with the root of the illnesses, which are not physical. They are internal. They are related with the state of the mind, the state of the heart, the state of our willpower. So to really address the causes of illness, to really achieve health, we have to learn to transform energy. And the, more, the higher we can reach, the more subtle aspects of energy we can access, the more profound that transformation will be. Let me make that really clear to you. There are many people who approach spirituality in their physical bodies, and they think if they simply go and do yoga every day, that they are going to awaken consciousness and raise the kundalini and become masters. And really sad that they think that way because it's completely wrong. Awakening doesn't begin and, and propagate from physical action. You can do a million mantras with your physical body and they will have absolutely no impact on you spiritually if your vital energy is not there, if your emotions are afflicted with problems and your mental state is afflicted with problems, your willpower is off someplace else, your consciousness is off someplace else, it will have no effect. None. But if you can unify all these, if your consciousness is focusing will and calming the mind, calming the heart, calming the vital energy and harnessing that force, stilling the physical body and directing the sum of all that energy into that mantra, you can immediately access any plane of consciousness in the tree of life. Immediately. That isn't hard to access those levels. What's hard is to unify all those forces. And the science to do that is meditation. Likewise, people think that by harnessing merely the vital energy that they can awaken consciousness and become masters. They ignore the afflictions of their emotions. They ignore the state of their mentality. They're wrong. They're absolutely mistaken. These type of people study kundalini yoga, reiki, other types of practices where they manipulate energy, but they ignore psychology. They ignore the superior aspects, which are the real beginning of health. Likewise, there are people who only approach spirituality emotionally. They think by devotion to God, through prayer, through song, that they will awaken consciousness and unify with absolute. And they are wrong. Because likewise, they ignore the state of the mind. They ignore how their willpower is trapped in affliction. So really, the path unifies all of these. That's why we call this the fourth way. It doesn't merely rely on these lower aspects. Like the mental approach, those people think that by memorizing scripture, really memorizing the teaching and being able to debate the teaching and having all that stored in their mind that they will reach God and they're also mistaken. The true way is as Jesus says, to take heed that the light which is in thee be not darkness. That is the path. 
to transform our darkness into light. We study ourselves. This is the first thing. We need to study the teaching intellectually. We need to have devotion to God and prayer. We need to work with the vital energy. We need to work with the physical body and keep it healthy. But none of those on their own can accomplish the work. We need all of them. But what accomplishes the work is to transform our darkness into light. And he says how to do it here. If thy whole body therefore be full of light. Remember that body is not just the physical body. It is these, all these aspects. Emotional, mental, vital, physical, and will. All of that has to be filled with light. That soma. Now really here, soma is referring to the soul. The bodies of the soul. Now look, take notice here that he's saying, if thy whole body therefore be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light. He doesn't say the whole body shall be full of light. Interesting, right? There's a difference. And what is the whole? It's the whole tree of life. The whole of everything. The whole of one's being. And not only that, the whole of the world. What happens when a true master is emerging. As Jesus states, they cannot hide their light. They transmit that light to everything and they inspire everyone simply by their example. So that's what this means. Many people want to go out in the world and start being a great spiritual teacher and a master, et cetera, et cetera, without really working on themselves first. And they've got it backwards. When we really develop that light, it shines. Just as he says, when the bright shining of a candle enlightens us, the light just emerges on its own, naturally. So the Bible and all the scriptures say that we need to clean ourselves. As in Jeremiah, wash thine heart from pollution that thou mayest be saved. How long shall thy vain thoughts lodge within thee? And Jesus many times pointed out that the intellectuals and the fanatics love to make themselves appear clean. But in fact, they don't do anything to clean themselves inside. And the real work is inside, not in appearances. Now, let me point out to you that this phrase from Jeremiah is pointing out perfect agreement with Buddhism. It says, wash thine heart. How long shall thy vain thoughts? So it's saying that this levels mind heart are equal. Now, Paracelsus, who we had an image of in the beginning, said that all sicknesses have their beginning in three substances salt, sulfur, or mercury. And what this means is that they can have their origin in the world of matter, the sphere of the soul, or the kingdom of the mind. And this is what we've explained. All illnesses can originate in the different parts of ourselves. The most powerful ones come from the deeper levels. Now, obviously, in a, in a lecture of this kind, we can't give you all the knowledge that you would need to deal with all the illnesses that exist. But we have many things that you can study, books and courses that you can study to acquire that type of knowledge that will help you lead, reach that and find that. Primarily, what we want to express to you is that the methods of healing that you will find in this tradition or traditions like it come from the point of view that we have tried to explain today, and that is healing begins not with the physical, but with the internal. To really find health, we have to work on the psyche. Now, the most profound medicine is hidden in all the scriptures and all the traditions. Obviously, what we've been explaining is a psychological approach to medicine. But on its own, that psychological approach cannot accomplish much. And this is 
has evidence in all the traditions around the world that really try to study the psyche, but have yet to heal anyone. If you really look at the history of the psychological and philosophical traditions around the world, they really can't put an example forward of someone that was cured. If you go and ask a psychiatrist or a psychologist, have, have they cured someone? They can't say that they have. They have helped people, perhaps. But they cannot tell you they have cured someone because they don't know how to cure them. And they will admit that. An honest one will admit it. Conversely, or contrary to that, in the esoteric tradition, we can state definitively that the knowledge is there to cure any illness. The knowledge is there. The healing methods are there. It's just a matter of accessing them and being able to apply them and having the right to that healing. So before we go to that, let me explain something. The causes of illness are very uh, complicated, very subtle. If you really want to understand the causes of illness in detail, there's a book called Esoteric Medicine and Practical Magic, which examines the causes of illness and provides a way to study them and eventually learn how to deal with them. But it is a very, very profound work. So let me skip ahead so we can get some time. The most profound medicine we have was explained by Paracelsus. This is beyond psychology. It's beyond medicines physically, pills. And he explained in one of his writings, the tincture of the philosophers is a universal medicine and consumes all diseases. By whatsoever name they are called, just like an invisible fire. The dose is very small, but its effect is most powerful. By means thereof, I have cured the leprosy, venereal disease, dropsy, the falling sickness, colic, scab, and similar afflictions. Also lupus, cancer, nolimitangere, fistulus, and the whole race of internal diseases more surely than one could believe. Modern readers would find this very proud and boastful. But the truth is that Paracelsus is a great master. And he's saying this as just a statement of fact, not with pride. It was just a statement of what he was able to do in the time that he was known physically and active visibly. And he continues with, for when the seed is once made sound, all else is perfected. This, therefore, is the most excellent foundation of a true physician, the regeneration of the nature and the restoration of youth. After this, the new essence itself drives out all that is opposed to it. To effect this regeneration, the powers and virtues of the tincture of philosophers were miraculously discovered and up to this time have been used in secret and kept concealed by the true spadrists. That word spadrist is a term referring to a specific class of alchemist. So the first sentence of this is the most important. For when the seed is once made sound, all else is perfected. That sentence reveals the whole science of Gnosis, all the mysteries of the Judea, uh, Jewish tradition that they call Dat, and what in Asian philosophy is called Tantra. That sentence contains it. But to know what that means, one has to be educated. You cannot guess. You cannot assume. You cannot find it on your own. You have to be given that knowledge. Traditionally, as he states, it has been kept secret, kept concealed by the true practitioners of that knowledge, which by his tradition is called alchemy. And that knowledge is how to take a seed, which is the beginning of a being, and make it perfect so that the result of that seed is perfection, perfect health. Simple in concept, difficult in practical work. So alchemy is that tradition. And we've given courses about that, and there are many books that you can read to study alchemy. We don't have time to explain all that today. That is the most important and most profound medicine that exists. Alchemy, tantra, daat. There is no medicine more powerful in terms of something that you can access with your physical body and apply to yourself with your physical body 
and have it affect your whole psyche, your whole being. There's no medicine more powerful. And that medicine is hidden inside of each of us. It is latent. It is lying in wait, ready for its development, waiting for us to access it and cultivate it and perfect it. And for centuries, it was hidden behind myths, allegories, cryptic images, and cryptic statements. And now it is revealed openly. And of course, obviously, it is related with sexuality. It is the most profound energy we have access to physically. Much more powerful than atomic energy. Atomic energy is very destructive, the way the scientists have accessed it. But this energy, the sexual energy that you have, creates life. No scientist has done that in a laboratory. They've modified life, copied life. But they have never created it. The only way they've done that is to go home with their husband or wife and make babies. That energy, sexual energy, is what provides the seed, the root element, which when it's perfected becomes the tincture of the philosophers. It becomes the universal medicine. And that medicine applies not only to our physical health, but all the levels of our being. It's hidden there. So really, everything else that we explain in the rest of this talk about healing, about health, depends on that. As we explained earlier, you know, the one who simply does physical movements is limited to that. It doesn't penetrate into everything. But working with the sexual energy, it penetrates into everything. Without any exception. That energy is multidimensional. It's not merely physical. So when we look for healing, we need to look at the root causes. Obviously, physically is the first place we will discover illness. Now, the basis of discovering illness should be this. Let's make this really clear. And the reason I started the lecture the way I did. We need to firstly understand what is health. Health is not what's depicted in magazines and television. Health is not having the perfectly chiseled muscles and the perfect hair and looking like someone that everybody envies. That is not health. That is external appearances. Those are illusions. And there are people that go and get surgeries to make themselves look healthy. They're just liars. True health is psychological, mental, emotional, and physical. So when we really want to start understanding what is our health, we really need to look at the baseline comparison, Arcadia, Eden, that primordial state of humanity. And what marked that? What are the defining characteristics of that state of health? Peace, harmony, experiential knowledge of the divine. The humanity of Arcadia did not believe in angels or gods. They didn't need to believe in that because they walked and talked with the gods. They knew the gods directly, personally. They could go up to those gods and talk to them, interact with them, get teachings from them. We don't have that. That's a very significant sign of our state of health is that we often don't even believe that that can happen. So when we analyze our health, we need to start from that point of view. What is my health in relation with the Arcadian level of being? Someone who knows the divinity, our inner divinity, and can access teachings from our inner divinity, and can get guidance from our inner divinity, and loves our inner divinity. If we don't have those things, we're very sick. And we need to start applying these techniques. The most important ones are the ones I already explained. To learn to transform impressions. Especially when you're in the spiritual work. So important. To really sincerely analyze and observe yourself. Why is this critical? Physical afflictions are difficult. There's no question about that. If you have an injury or you have a sickness, this is an impediment. 
And it, it takes energy to manage that. It's hard to manage that. It can interfere with everything in life. But really, you can apply whatever medicines you have access to. And on that note, let me state that in this tradition, we, we view all things in order to take what is useful from them and to reject what is not useful. If you become sick physically and you need medicine, take your medicine. We don't reject or accept any tradition in particular. We have medicines in our tradition, but we also rely on the medicines of other traditions because we know that Gnosis is in all traditions. It's on all places. Some of us go to Eastern doctors, some to Western doctors. That's up to you. The main thing is to preserve and continue your physical health as best you can. That's not what we're really here to talk about. But I mention it because people always ask about that. The main thing is, as debilitating as a physical illness can be, they are less powerful than illnesses that are emerging in the internal levels. Far less powerful. And also, often, less noticeable. Now, any of us, if we were to be asked, do you happen to know if you have cancer? Or do you have this other illness or that illness? We would say, I really have no idea. And we'd have to go to some specialist to get some machine or some test to look into our body to tell us, right? Because we have no way of accessing that. But how are we going to then, if we can't even look inside the physical body to see what's wrong with it, how are we going to look into the more subtle levels of ourselves in order to diagnose our illnesses? If we can't even see into the most dense, most superficial level, which is the physical level, how are we going to diagnose the other ones? You see the difficulty. And it's especially difficult to recognize an illness when you've always had it. It's hard to recognize that what you have as your state is a sickness because you have nothing to compare it with. No experience that you remember that tells you, wait a minute, what I'm feeling now is actually wrong. This is actually an illness. It isn't normal. But we've become so accustomed to our illnesses, we can't even recognize that. So in that way, what we need to learn is how to diagnose. And by doing that, the way to do that is to look into the root causes. And the first step to that is to learn how to really observe, to really know how to study ourselves. Obviously, that begins with our three brains. Really learning to look at and, and understand what's happening in us continually. How we are transforming our impressions in the mental brain. Through our intellect. Through our thoughts. Are our thoughts characterized by certain trends? Do we find that there are certain patterns that happen in us psychologically? We should be finding that because we all have repetitive patterns. Every one of us. In fact, it's stated in this tradition that 96% of thoughts, human thoughts at our level, are harmful and negative and are the same thoughts that we had yesterday and the day before that. They repeat every day. So in that way, we should be able to find those patterns easily if we really observe ourselves. Secondly, we need to do that with our emotions to really be able to observe the patterns that we have emotionally, the states that we experience emotionally, the qualities that we experience emotionally, we have to start to recognize them and look at them as though we are a doctor observing a patient. We need to be studying our illnesses. And of course, physically, we have to observe that as well in our habits and our tendencies. But now let's explain something really important here. I already said that physical illnesses are obviously painful and difficult and that the more internal ones are more powerful, more influential, more subtle, harder to see. Now this applies also to infections, to viruses. All of us know that when flu season comes around or, or there's some kind of infectious uh, organism moving in our community, we have to take precautions. We have to wash our hands. We shouldn't you know, eat or drink after someone who's sick because we will contract that virus or bacteria or whatever is causing that illness, and we will get it physically. We all know that, even if we don't really use the rules 
you know, to be clean. We don't realize, however, that there are emotional infections, mental infections, that are millions of times more dangerous than any physical infection. Millions of times more dangerous. The flu is unpleasant. Any sickness is unpleasant. But as I stated earlier, they come and they go. Sometimes they kill a person. But the, with the death of that physical body, the illness dies as well. And that person goes on and is usually born into a new body, right? And so they start over without that illness. But they carry with them the mental and emotional ones. Those don't go away with physical death. So part of our observation of ourselves has to be not merely what we're experiencing physically, although that's important, but how are we being influenced and affected by our environment, by our colleagues, our families, people we interact with emotionally and mentally. And we will quickly discover that many of the things that we think and feel, we really don't want to think and feel and are quite negative and harmful. And that's because we're taking in impressions without transforming, without selecting what we take in. All you have to do is put the radio on certain stations or the TV on certain stations or read certain websites to be infected by hate, by fear, by greed, by envy, by lust. If you observe yourself, you'll note you have a certain state, physically, emotionally, and mentally, but then you go and you turn on that channel and you start hearing the words and you start to get angry or you start to get afraid or you start to feel envy. I really need, I want that. Why don't I have that? All these new feelings and states come into you and you're infected. And we don't even realize it. And we make life decisions from those infections. One angry person can infect the entire world with his words. Watch the news, hear the words of the politicians, the words of those who are cultivating and spreading fear and anger and blame, and you will become infected by that. And you'll say, yeah, he's right. We need to overthrow the government. Or, yeah, he's right. We need to ban that corporation and we need to go and change this political system and we need to do this and that all with anger or with fear. We didn't feel that before. You lived your 20, 30, 40 years without feeling that and then all of a sudden somebody said a few words in your ear and you become a radical. And we all do it. And it happens with spiritual things. It happens with emotional things with TV shows, with magazines, with books, with any type of material that we can ingest into ourselves through the senses. And that's what's happening all over the world. And that is what the cunning people take advantage of. That weakness that humanity has. The cunning ones make use of this weakness to a to continue with their power and to continue with their control. And it's a very simple thing for them to do. All they have to do is give us a few toys, some alcohol, some drugs, some cigarettes, and we don't complain. We just give them all our money and all the power and they continue doing what they want to do. And then we die. That isn't the way. We need to learn that our basic health really is determined by how we ingest not just physical substances, but emotional and mental ones. And we need to choose good ones. Remember what Jesus and the Buddha stated. Our experience of happiness or suffering is determined by what passes through our psyche. Not only what we take in, but what we give out. Not only but what we ingest, but what we say what we think, what we feel, how we act. That transformation of energy overall is what determines our health. If you want mental health and emotional health, 
Take in good substances with your mind and heart. Substances that vibrate in harmony with your goal. If your goal is spiritual development and self-realization and the full expression of your being in yourself to restore that Arcadian level of life in which you have harmony with the divine and with everything, then take in substances that correspond with that vibration. That means you cannot read gossip. You cannot watch garbage. You cannot ingest poison through your senses, through your mind, through your heart and your body. Right? It's obvious. If an athlete wants to compete at the highest level, to go to the Olympics or whatever competition is the highest level for them, they cannot eat junk food. It will kill their performance. This is so obvious. But it's equally obvious for the spiritual aspirant. The one who wants to achieve the highest levels of spirituality cannot eat garbage with their mind and heart and the body. And yet, everyone does. All of the so-called spiritual seekers continue with all the bad habits they always had. Watching their favorite shows, playing their favorite games, pursuing their old pursuits. And thinking that somehow magically the being will take them to the heights of development. And that is a lie that we tell ourselves. This path is radical. It is revolutionary. And that revolution is inside psychologically. Everything about us has to change if we want change. If you don't want change, don't change. And nothing will change. It will just get worse. So in addition to that, we have a lot of other methods that we use to help with our healing. The most important, obviously, is alchemy, which I mentioned previously. And for that, we have many books and courses you can study. To supplement that transformation of energy, we have many other techniques. The most important one is meditation. There's no comparison with its importance. As we explained in the course on alchemy, Alchemy is about transmutation, and that word transmutation means to change thoroughly. And that's in all levels, not just physically or sexually, but emotionally and mentally and spiritually, in our willpower, in every level. Meditation is the way we do it. The transformation of sexual energy provides the energy, but meditation is how we use that energy. You can transmute every day for 40 years, you will not achieve self-realization. If you don't meditate, if you don't become master of meditation, you won't. And that's why our teacher, Samuel M. Vior, stated in his book, Spiritual Power of Sound, that it is impossible to experience the being unless you become a master of meditation. There's no getting around that. We need mastery over ourselves. And that's how we acquire it, is through meditation. We also need to learn prayer. We learn mantras and rites and runes. Specific to every tradition is a type of Eucharist, a type of transformation of substances that is also necessary in order to nourish the soul, the consciousness. Now, the Eucharist, as we taught in our course on the sacraments of the Gnostic Church, has many forms. In this particular tradition, we have several forms of that. And the most basic, most fundamental is one that anyone can use on a daily basis or weekly basis according to your schedule. And that's where you learn how to ingest a little bit of grain and a little bit of juice in accompaniment with prayer. And your prayer charges those elements and connects you to divinity and it provides you with a type of fuel for the soul. This is really essential. And finally, we have other healing techniques with plants and teas and, of course, changing our diet. We have a course about diet uh, called, um, what was the name of that? Caring for your temple. Yeah, Caring for Your Temple. Beautiful course about how to care for yourself physically and spiritually. So these methods, of course, are taught in many books. We don't have time to explain them all today. And you can find those there. But as we stated in the beginning, the main thing is to really learn about that Arcadian state and understand that this is really what health is, is to reach that Edenic level, the level of health that we had 
long ago when humanity lived in Eden in harmony with not only nature but with divinity. And that state is recoverable. But as I explained, to reach that, everything in us that is impure has to die. Everything. It's a radical transformation. It's a transmutation, a complete and thorough change. Do you have any questions? Yes. That's right. <clears throat> I said that we are not the brain. And of course, in ancient times, the science was learned how to transplant the brain or an, and other organs into other bodies. And scientists are trying to do that now. There are scientists, and you might be surprised who's funding all of that stuff. There are, there are people now in the world who are trying to transfer human consciousness into machines. This is a thread that's been developing for about 100 years, but it's a lot of money being put into it. This ancient practice of transplanting uh, a brain transplants not just the brain, but many aspects of the physiology into a new organism. And scientifically, that is possible to do. But it is an abomination. It is a corruption of nature. And that's why that group that learned that was punished quite severely because that was not something in harmony with nature. But it is possible. The thing is that our psyche is intimately related with our atoms on all levels. So our bodies, and when we look at physical bodies, we see the physical aspect. But every atom of a body has that multiple dimensionality. So the brain itself, because it's so intimately connected with the mental body and with how the soul interacts with that, that if you move it to another body, that connection is also moved. And we can see that in any kind of transplant. We know, obviously, of stories of people getting heart transplants or limb transplants or organ transplants, and their behaviors change. You've heard of this? So there are even celebrities that have gotten, you know, let's say, for example, they got a heart transplant. Now they have a pig heart instead of a human heart. Their behaviors change. The personality changes. Because the atoms of that other being are brought in, and the psyche, the psychology of that other being, so that kind of transference is possible, but it's really, really bad. It mixes things in a really harmful way. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and as you study in his books, he explains that, that illnesses have a psychological component, and that's what he's talking about is that many of the illnesses that we experience, not all, but many, are rooted in our psychology, and some of those are related with the causal eyes, which are very deep tendencies in our psyche. And some of those repeat there are patterns, there are occurrences that happen where we get certain illnesses over and over, and it's because of those illnesses that are in the body. If you think about it, it makes sense. If you have a certain type of mold in your house, and you clean it up everywhere, but the mold is originating under the floor, it'll keep coming back. You won't ever get rid of it. It's the same thing with the psyche. If you don't address the source of it, it will keep coming back. So that's, in that sense, it's a causal eye. It's something that's producing that cause again and again because the root has not been cleaned. Yeah? A lot of questions. One back here. I'm glad you asked that. It's something I meant to address in this lecture, so let me see if I can explain. There are many types of suffering. But one of the main causes of suffering is simply karma. It's simply that we've performed harmful actions in the past, and those catch up with us, and we need to pay those debts. Moreover, to pay those debts, often we have to suffer through 
certain experiences, right? In order to become cognizant of why we shouldn't do that thing. And there are many, many aspects of that, and it's quite a delicate subject. And I don't think we have time to explore it in detail. But in the nature of walking the spiritual path, don't, I don't want anyone to have the misperception that as soon as you enter into the Gnostic teaching, that you will become perfectly healthy and you will be like that from now on. It isn't like that. We have karma. We have to pay our karma. And certain karmas are paid through illness. Simple as that. The body will die. And generally speaking, in this type of path, whether you call yourselves whatever you want, if you're really walking the spiritual path, the death of that body is generally going to be produced by some really difficult illness or a form of suffering that helps you purge and pay the karma. This is necessary. And the one who's really walking the path doesn't seek to avoid that. All of us are terrified, right? We don't want that. We don't want to go through that experience of like getting a cancer or some really awful illness or like Joan of Arc to be burned alive. But that's what was necessary for that initiate in order to pay the debts that they had. It will be different for everyone. It's not the same for every initiate. Everyone will pay according to their own particular idiosyncrasy, their own karma. Now, on that note, let me explain as well that when we're working in this type of teaching, our goal is health. And what I'm trying to express to you is you will not achieve it until you die and resurrect. And on the way, the best you can do is to achieve a relative degree of health. Enough health that you can keep working, that you can keep moving. This is what we need. We don't want to become fanatics of exercise or fanatics of diet or fanatics of doing whatever types of rituals or practices we think give health. No. Our focus needs to be on meditation, self-observation, prayer, putting in motion those three factors so that we are dying psychologically, growing spiritually, serving others, but with our eye on resurrection, reaching that. It's a long work. Along the way, we will suffer. And when we do, whether it's through a physical difficulty, emotional or mental difficulty, whatever the experiences that we have, we have to learn to transform that suffering. To accept it in the cases where we need to accept it. And in the cases where we need to transform it, to transform it. This is really an art form. It is not an easy thing to get through. So how do we do it? Who is the real physician? Who is the real doctor? It isn't us. Our being is. The divinity that we have within us is the one who heals us and who guides us. As it says in all the scriptures, the one who heals us is our inner divinity. It says here in Exodus, For I am yod he vav he that healeth thee. Now sometimes the healing is painful. Sometimes what we need to go through in order to become healed is painful. Like, for example, physically, certain things you have to get a surgery. Sometimes, for example, if someone breaks a bone, it may not have hurt that much. But setting the bone can be excruciatingly difficult, but it's needed to heal properly. So the cure actually was worse than the injury. It's true, right? It can happen in this way. Spiritually speaking, psychologically speaking, we need to be aware that to pay our debts, to become healed, it can be unpleasant. It's not an easy path. This is not a path where we're just treading through flowers and the angels and birds are singing to us. It isn't like that. It is like Dante's Inferno. We have to go into the depths of our own inner hell and really perceive the depths of suffering that are in us and in humanity. That is very difficult, very painful. But to do it consciously, to do it willingly, is to transform that into something beneficial. It is to go into that experience knowing we're doing that and accepting that and transforming that. So this is what's required here, to rely on our innermost to guide us in these experiences. Now, I want to make one more comment before I take a couple more questions. And that is, I focus primarily today on, on the self-generated sicknesses. 
which are really the vast majority of our experiences. Most of the things that we experience in terms of our suffering, physically, emotionally, or mentally, will be our own responsibility. And that's, that's what Buddhism emphasizes and Christianity and all the great traditions emphasize that. But there are illnesses and problems and sufferings that others can inflict on us. Firstly, unconsciously. If we have friends who love to go drinking and we choose to go hang out with them, we will start drinking and we will take that bad impression, that bad influence, and we will create problems, right? So that's a choice we made, accepting an influence from something that's harmful. Same with those who, if we have colleagues or coworkers or family members who love pornography or they love any kind of degeneration, we take those negative impressions into ourselves, they will influence us and infect us. But more subtle and potentially more powerful can be those who intend us harm, who want to interfere with what we're doing, who may have resentment against us or envy of us or are afraid of us or want to conquer us or whatever their motivations may be and have evil will. And they utilize whatever means they have available in order to impede us. Sometimes they do that unconsciously. They do it through their resentment and anger, through talking about us to others, through spreading lies or gossip about us, and that can infect everyone, including ourselves, because we hear it and then we resent them. That's an obstacle for us. Worse, they can do those things consciously. And worse than that, they can do them with magic, witchcraft, where they utilize substances, rituals, mantras, and different techniques they have available to influence us and affect us in the physical level or the emotional level or the mental level. And the only way you can accurately diagnose these things is if you're consistently studying yourself and the teachings and really understanding how these things work. Now, a lot of students study this material, and as soon as they start having nightmares or they start having other problems. They immediately assume it's witchcraft and they start panicking and going to the instructors. How do I, there's a witch or there's a sorcerer. Not realizing that in the vast majority of cases, they're generating their own problem. It's their own fear. It's their own anger. It's their own lust that's afflicting them. In other cases, yeah, there are black magicians. There are witches and sorcerers who do things. But let me make something really clear about that. Firstly, we gave a course, and there are many books about that that you can study. They're all referenced in the PDF. Divine Science is the main one. No black magician can harm you if you have no vulnerability. Simple as that. Those who are afraid of black magic or witchcraft or these other types of things, don't focus on those people. Ignore them. If they want to do that, leave them alone. Don't go after them. Instead, change what in you is vulnerable to what they may attempt against you. You know why they can't bring down a master or an angel? Because that master or angel has no lust, has no pride, has no fear. If you purge yourself of those elements, those black magicians can't touch you. They can't do anything to you. Because those are the tools they use against you. They use yourself against you. This is why we need to analyze ourselves so rigorously and we start to see that we have doubt, we have fear, or we have resentment or anger or hate or lust, discontentment, we're not happy with something in our lives. Those are precisely the things that others will use against us to hurt us, to gain power over us. So if you change those things, they can't do anything. Now, in context with that, we need help. We need to rely on our being, our divine mother, and we need to use certain practices to defend ourselves. We've given a course about that called uh, Defense for Spiritual Warfare, and we have several books, The Divine Science, Esoteric Medicine. Uh, there's other techniques in Igneous Rose. Many books, many teachings about that. We need to utilize those things. So sorry for the long answer, but I wanted to cover that. Yes? Um, so, I don't really see a contradiction here, but some people might see a contradiction because you said that your health begins from the top, the higher levels down. But then you said that when you're looking at the three brains, the intellectual, emotional, and the sexual, you said that health begins with the sexual. Mm -hmm. and that's Where does the sexual energy come from? 
it would be the answer. Who provides that? It's provided by God. The power in the sexual energy is divine. It comes from divinity. So even though we see physical representation of that in the sexual organs and the substances that are sexual in the body, the power that's in it is not physical. It's, it's more subtle. That energy, that force, the substances there are multidimensional as well. So there's not a, by appearance, it may appear to be a contradiction, but when you really look into it, there's none. It's a good question. Yes? So um, we talked a lot about the deep causes of, um, of sicknesses today. But um, like there are many like, really debilitating illnesses mm -hmm. that um, are preventable just by physical things, like, mm -hmm. like a polio, for instance. The, guy, the, the doctor comes in, he, he gives you a, a, a vaccine, and he's not a wizard. He's not doing anything to your, your, your internal body. He's just doing something to your physical body. And now your physical body is, isn't afflicted by, the, by that illness. By appearance. So you it still, appears you, that way. You can still have the polio even if it, it doesn't manifest in your physical body. No. What is being delivered through the physical mechanism, the medicine is not physical. It's just coming to, through a physical mechanism. So, for example, in your body... Your body is the vehicle of subtle forces. Yeah. In the same way, medicines physically are the vehicles of subtle forces. When you ingest a plant, you destroy the body of that plant to get the subtle forces that are hidden in it. Same with a medicine. You take in that medicine in order to get the subtle forces hidden inside that medicine. So the doctors, like the pharmacists and medical practitioners who craft medicines, they're manipulating physical substances to get at the subtle forces that are hidden in there whether it's vital or astral or mental or causal, however deep those substances are, are penetrating. So the physical appearance is that the doctor gives the medicine to the child and the child becomes healed. But the healing was facilitated internally. We're blind to that. We don't see that. But the actual healing did not happen physically. It happens because of the substances that are delivered through that mechanism. In the same way that the transplant happens with organs, right? Someone gets an organ transplant. The matter is just the bearer of the subtle forces. The matter itself is irrelevant. It's just a vehicle, a vessel. Now, what's interesting about that is that there are medicines that don't exist physically, but you can take them. That's where the real medicines are. They're internally. And we can access those medicines through spiritual practice. For example, a mantra. There's no physical component, really. I mean, you can say a mantra with your mouth and make a vibration with your throat. But the efficacy of that medicine is in the internal worlds, in the fifth and sixth dimensions. That's where the real power of that mantra is. You can get a more powerful effect from a mantra if you say it silently with perfect concentration and meditation and receive the medicine of that mantra. And it will affect you physically. Anyone can prove that to themselves. Find a prayer or mantra that you love sit in perfect silence, meditate on that prayer, and you will find that after a certain period of time, everything about you is transformed. Even your physical presence is different. Isn't that right? I mean, when you go to your temple or your church to pray, when you come out, you're different. And that's because of the medicines that are transmitted internally. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the physical aspect is the least important. Sometimes it's needed to transmit a medicine, but it isn't always needed. In what sense? What do you mean? Well, let's put it this way. I think I understand what you're getting at. The, the, the thing to understand is that the light itself never changes. It becomes modified. So its appearance is different. But it's the same light in all the levels of existence. 
the same fire. It's that false. And we call that Christ also. It's the same force. So in whatever level that light is present, it's simply perceived in a different way. And here's an example of that. Right now, we're in a dark room. And if you were to immediately go outside, you wouldn't be able to see. Because your eyes need to adjust to that light. There's light in both places, but the light is different. It's the same light, but it's a different intensity. And conversely, if we were outside in the bright light and came into a dark room, we wouldn't be able to see, even though there's light there. So in the same way, in everything, there is light. It's a matter of being able to perceive it. And once perceiving it, transforming it. The transformation is the harder part. The perception of the light isn't that hard. So awakening to be able to see light is not difficult. Like awakening clairvoyance, it's not difficult. There's simple things that you can learn, and you learn those things, and you learn to see clairvoyantly. It's not a big deal. It's actually the natural state. What's difficult is to transform that and see objectively. And the only way to see the light as it truly is is if there are no filters between the perceiver and the perceived. And we have a lot of filters. Those filters are what we call pride and anger and greed and gluttony and all of that, our sense of self. To see the light objectively requires there be no boundary or barrier between the perceiver and the perceived. The one who's seeing the light and the light itself. And that's what this is pointing at in that quote from Jesus. We need to really become that light. So the path that we study here is the path to become nothing. To die in every way so that we just become that light a transmitter of that light. And that's how we know the light perfectly. So if someone's awakening in the negative way, they are seeking to become something. That's the difference. They want to be something. They want to be a master. They want to be respected. They want to be a leader. They want to be feared. They want to be envied or admired. They want to be followed. So they want to be something. So all their perception of the light is filtered by that desire. So they don't see the light clearly. They see, but not the truth. They see what they want to see. Opposed to that are those who really are following in Jesus' path, which is the path towards resurrection. In that context, we seek to become the light itself. To not be anything but a vessel for that light to move through. And that means the purge of all desire. Even the desire for spirituality, even the desire to be an angel, even the desire to be a master, all that has to go away. So we become perfectly empty of all things. Well, I would say that from the perspective of the, the level of teaching that he's studying, that, that makes sense. That he wouldn't want to live in a world without suffering because he wouldn't learn anything else. But the reality is that there is knowledge that is, knowledge is infinite. The consciousness itself is infinite. Really. We have no concept of, of the, the heights that the consciousness can reach. And the levels in which we are, in which suffering is so pervasive, are an extremely narrow band in a very dense level of manifested nature. And so for us, with our, with our perception and our way of seeing things, we can't imagine there's anything beyond this. But there is. We have this sense of self that expects that everything we perceive is a model for everything that exists. Right? We think that the way we see must be this way everywhere, in every world, in every universe. But it isn't. In fact, it's the opposite. The way we perceive and the way we are is completely abnormal. It's rare. So you're saying, like, also, like, what would you learn in those worlds that are that much more perfect? You, know? you would learn about those other levels of perfection, right. which are far beyond this dense level of suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so his teachings are very beautiful and very important yeah. for what we're doing, but they aren't teachings that, are, that correspond to the higher levels of attainment. They're beautiful. And I understand what he's, what he's expressing there, but really, we need to go way beyond 
this level. And we're nowhere near that. You know, there, there are many uncountable numbers of worlds where there's no suffering in the way we experience suffering. Uncountable. Yeah, here is where the knowledge is contained. So those beings who want knowledge, you know, study in, in places like this to acquire that knowledge. But that's not the extent of knowledge. It's knowledge that's corresponding to this particular karmic scenario. But the, to, to, to try to, you know, represent or illustrate the totality of the existing knowledge is absolutely impossible. That's, you know, tr that's like trying to intellectualize the absolute <laughs> You know, trying to come up with some concept that explains the absolute. There's no such thing. The absolute itself is a kind of knowledge that's inexpressible. So that's really where you start looking at things like paramasa satyas and these types of beings that are just really incomprehensible to us. So far beyond this level. So we have a long way to go to reach anything like that. <laughs> Any other questions before we close? Yes. So this gets brought up all the time, but you you, um, you talked about it today, so I'll I'll, uh, uh, I'll mention it again. The um, you talked about organ donations or, or organ transplants. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that, that our psyche is embedded in our, uh, our our atoms. So if my organs go into someone else, does does that mean that like my consciousness or my 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 egos? go with, uh, with that person, I have to wait for them to die to recollect that? No. Like, what, no it's, what is that, 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 that <clears throat> aspect of me that goes? It's a good question. So when the thing is that in your atoms, physically speaking, it, it's everything about you has your signature, so to speak. It was all produced by your past behavior. So the health, relative degree of health that you have and the state of being that you have is produced by everything you ever did throughout time. Everything from ever produced what you are right now. So if you took a part of you and put it into some other being, they would get the idiosyncrasy of that karmic stream, some portion of that. It would be an influence. So in the same way that you can influence someone with your words or your thoughts you know, or your, your talking or your language or your behaviors, and you can influence them, so you make a friend and, and you're really into a certain sport and they see that you enjoy that so then they want to try it and then they start doing that same sport. So that type of influence. That influence is transmitted through the emotional, the mental, and the physical behavior because he perceived all of that. But if you were to take part of your body and put it into that friend, he would receive even more of an influence. It's not that he would receive your specific karma. He would receive the results and idiosyncrasies that you've cultivated up till now. So he may start to think things like you think or to feel things like you think or to behave in ways that you behave. And this is what we find in transplant cases. Someone that gets a transplant all of a sudden has different interests. They, be, they can even adopt certain characteristics in their speech, language, personality. All these things change. And that's because of that... that uh, we can say astral signature that's present in all the atoms of the transferred material. It doesn't mean that because you committed a murder or a killing that that person becomes responsible for your past action. That's ludicrous. But that's how people have interpreted this. It doesn't mean that at all. Each of us receives according to our works. If you commit a crime, you answer for that crime. The other person doesn't answer for that crime. You do. It's logical. And the gods know that. The gods are way more logical than we are, and they're the ones that manage the law. So when they have to apply the law, they apply it according to how things function. So that's how it works. It's not complicated. And this is the most profound transfer of elements. And you see this very easily. In sexual connection between any two people, there's a very powerful transfer of behavior and tendencies and ways of thinking. We call it an atomic exchange, but it doesn't mean physical atoms. It's the atoms of all the levels of a person. And anyone can see that. You go out and look at a couple that's been together 50 years. They look the same. They eat the same. They talk the same. I mean, that transference of influence is very strong. It's not the karma. 
if, if the husband does something wrong, he will suffer that, not the wife. She didn't do it. You know, if he runs over a dog, the owner of the dog is going to come after him, <laughs> right? Because he did it. That's how it works. The blood transfusion, organ transplants, and all those types of transfer of matter just transfer those sort of psychological tendencies. The use of the word karma there is in terms of action, in terms of an influence. Right. Yeah. It's a good question. Yes. More quick question. Another one. When we talk to you... Uh talked about the root of, of all these diseases, and whenever you talked about the root, you always listed the seven. Does this, uh, does this mean to imply that uh, the uh, Deborah and his head can also have diseases associated with them? No. Okay. So when we study the tree of life, we need to understand what we mean by suffering and what we mean by disease. As Paracelsus said, the diseases or sicknesses originate in salt, sulfur, or mercury, which apply to these lower aspects. Right. In dimensional terms, this is related with the fifth dimension and below. In terms of illness or disease, this is related with the fall from Eden and related with the two serpents and that the superior aspect of ourselves, the being itself, never falls. Right? Have evil, will. evil will is related with the human soul, the essence which does fall. That's what fell from Eden. That's what produced suffering and originated the entire process. But the divine soul and the atmic being never fall. There's no disease there. There's no sickness there. And in, in a certain context, when you study Arcadia, it can relate to that. It's like Olympus or Nirvana. It's, it's this, or the Garden of Hesperides. It's this level of perfection in which there's no illness, there's no problem, there's no anything. It's just a perfect world. And that's in us. That's the level of the being. The diseases and all the other things don't reach that. Now, stating that, let me explain that that doesn't mean there are no problems there. There are a lot of problems up there, but they're much more subtle than the problems we have here. And to understand those problems, you need to get into the depths of some very difficult philosophical subjects like the gunas and the tattvas and prana and, and disequilibrium that happens in very subtle levels of nature, which are hard to understand. Yeah. Sins of the soul is what we're talking about. And this is another, you know, another level up here where there is karma. And we call that level katansia. There are types of, it, we can say suffering in the sense that there are debts that are owed at superior levels of life, superior levels of nature. It's not the suffering that we have here. It's, it's different. We're talking about the suffering that we can understand and that we're experiencing now because that's really the urgent need. And then when we become masters and angels and Buddhas, then you can deal with the suffering and the karma of those levels, right? To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah, Lord, I'm